So Revelation 17 and 7, the Bible reads, And the angel said, so John is, is, is seeing this, uh, this vision, and the angel says to him in this vision, Wherefore didst thou marvel? So uh, John had previously seen the woman, and the Bible said at the end of verse number 6 that he was in admiration of her, he admired her, and by the time verse number 7 rolls around, the angel that is talking with John wants to, wants to know, Why did you marvel? Why were you looking at her in such admiration? That's verse number 7. And then finally, at in, in the end, of, in the, the middle part of the verse says, I, and the angel speaking, says, I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her. So again, there's a woman, there's a beast that's carrying her. We identified last week the beast that is carrying her as the Antichrist system. Uh, and also the beast in the book of Revelation is, is sometimes just referring to the Antichrist himself. Uh, but in verse number 7, uh, we see that there's a woman, there's a, there's a beast. And so the angel says, why did you wonder at what you saw, John? And then he says, I will tell thee the, the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. So the woman was beautiful. We know that. The beast was dreadful. It was ugly. It had seven heads, ten horns, ugly looking beast. And for some reason, Satan takes this beast that is ugly and dreadful. And he sits this beautiful woman up on top of her. Uh, up, up on top of the beast and now you have this imagery of this ugly beast and this beautiful woman and John is admired it is wondering at it is marveling at it is wondering what, it, what it's all about and the angel said why, why are you marveling I'm going to show you the mystery of the woman and I'm going to show you the mystery of the beast so tonight we want to take we want to last week we taught verse by verse by verse through this chapter this week what I want to do is, is understand this I want to look there's two different mysteries or two different identifications of two different mysteries here. One mystery is the mystery of the woman. The other is the mystery of the beast. We don't have time to cover both. So to, for this week, we're going to cover the mystery and the identity of the woman. Who is the woman, this beautiful woman, uh, that is on the back of such an ugly beast? And, and the beast is carrying her. Verse number 7 says, uh, it says, I will, uh, I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her. So who is this woman? That's what we want to look at tonight. So uh, go with me to, in Revelation 17 and verse number 18, and we're going to pick out some clues as to who this woman is. So who is this woman? Is she a physical person? Is she uh, somebody in, in government? Is she is she a particular woman? Uh, or is this some apocalyptic imagery that's described something else? So let's take a look at it. Verse number 18 of Revelation 17 says, And the woman which thou sawest is is that great what? City. City. So the first clue that we have, remember the angel said, I'm going to tell you the mystery of the woman. The angel is going to give us so many clues as to who this woman is that it is almost unmistakable, but it should be by the time we get done with the study tonight, who this woman is. So uh, so first of all, he, here's the first clue that I want to look at. The woman is a great uh, city. Now, now, so when you describe one of the lead as a great city, then I probably wouldn't. Uh, if I went if I got on the, uh, on the subway or the whatever they call that train heading out of Michigan City uh, and went to Chicago and you go down there to the, what is it, Millennium Station and you yeah. get off uh, the, 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 the subway thing there and you walk upstairs and, and you go up into downtown Chicago, you can look up at the big buildings and you could almost describe that as a great city. So we're getting closer. Right, so we know it's number one. Whoever this woman is, first of all, she's a city. Uh, second of all, she's a great city. So that pretty much, just by the fact that he puts a great on it, it pretty much rules out Waterloo, Coloma, Harford, Kalamazoo, Battle Creek. You know what I'm saying? It's got to be some big, grand, great place. Uh, and I would tell you, it's not Chicago. Yeah, it's not New York City. That's my. That's, this is, these are my opinions, and we'll see in in a minute as we dive into this. But for so first of all, we're starting to get one clue as to who the woman is. Well, first of all, she is a city. She's a city. So now we are looking for a geographical location. Everybody, do your head like this if you understand what a city is. We are looking for a geographical location on the earth. Amen. So if we. So what? What are we? What are we thinking? Well, uh, the woman. Before we know, before we know the, 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 the clue number one that she's a city, well, maybe we could be looking around at different uh, female figures in the culture that are antichrist like and they do antichrist things, maybe like Lady Gaga. Maybe yeah. she's the woman on the back of the antichrist system. Well, no, because she's maybe. Uh, 
may, may not be a good moral lady by any stretch of the imagination, but she's not a city. Right. Right? So, so we're sort of getting some clues as to who this woman is. Well, who is he? Well, first of all, she is a city. Now that she is a great city. So we're, now we know that we're looking not for a physical woman. We're looking for a geographical location. Not only are we looking for a geographical location, but we are looking for even smaller than that. We are looking for a city somewhere on the earth that's going to fit all the other clues that John has given us. Everybody with me? Amen. All right, so so she is a great city. Now, a lot of people have, have tried to discover, and there have been books written and movies made about who is this woman and, and, and what is her identity. And some have even pointed to the fact that they say the, the, the mystery woman uh, is the United States of America. Now, this is, you might be shocked by such a thing, but there are a lot of people out there who actually believe that. Now, I would say hey, the United States of America, in many ways is headed the wrong direction and is headed into antichrist thinking and we are quickly throwing off the Christian worldview that founded this country and uh, I mean we were getting rid of all of our history and all of our cartoons and all the things that used to be moral and wholesome but you can still listen to Lady Gaga and Tupac and that's not a problem and, and Hell's Bells and ACDC and that's not a problem but Dr. Seuss is a major problem in our society right so, so in the minds of these people who think so strange as far as I can tell. Uh, so, 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 no, and the America has a lot of issues. Uh, uh, I love America personally. I'd rather be here than any country on the face of the earth. But it has a lot of issues. But America is not a city. Right. America is a country, right? Uh, so it cannot be just by virtue of the fact that he said, the woman which thou sawest is that great city. We now automatically eliminate. There's no way the woman could be America, right? right. And so whatever books you read, whatever movies you see, whatever uh, the, the prophecy teachers you listen to, as far as I'm concerned, by virtue of the clue in verse number 18, America cannot be the woman. So clue number one, she is a city. And and number two, she is a great city. Everybody with me? Yeah. All right, look at verse number nine. Revelation 17 and verse number nine. Uh, and and uh, let's, let's look at that. Let's see what happens here. Verse number nine. It says, uh, in verse number nine, I got so many different things written so many different places, I got to figure out where they all are. Amen. Revelation 17 9 says, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. You know, some people's minds don't have wisdom. Right. Uh, that, that's, that's why they. they, they, they. <laughs> That's why they do some of the th crazy things they do. Look at your neighbor and say, Neighbor, half of this crowd is crazy. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Half of, half of the evidence. It seems like the, the world is getting even more cray cray, as the young folks yeah. say. Yeah. Yeah. I can say stuff like that anymore because I don't really qualify as young folk. I used to qualify as young folk. Now I'm middle aged folk. <laughs> so, so sometimes uh, there's a lot of. There's a lot of minds that are not filled with wisdom. Right. Uh, so we don't want to follow minds that are not filled with wisdom, do we? No. 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 So here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Amen. No. Revelation 17 and 7, 17 and 9. Uh, I may have said seven earlier, I don't know. Uh, nevertheless, the Revelation 17 and 9, that's the one I'm looking for, is she is not only a city, according to verse number 18, but she is a geographical city that now sits uh, on seven mountains. So now, does Water Bleed sit on seven mountains? No. No. Does Chicago, Illinois sit on seven mountains? No. The United States of America sit on seven mountains? Of course, it's a country. No, it doesn't. New York City doesn't even sit on seven mountains. And so, man, we so we know we're looking for a geographical location, some place on the earth that is a city, not a country, not a continent, not a river, but is a city, right? That's right. And now we also know that this the city needs to sit on seven mountains or seven raised elevation places on the earth. Now, now, so now some people have actually said that the woman is Jerusalem. Jerusalem. But I would have you know that while Jerusalem is a city and while Jerusalem is a great city, Jerusalem does not sit on seven mountains. So it kind of eliminates Jerusalem, doesn't it? So now there's only so many great cities on the face of the earth. I'm, I'm leaning you down a certain direction and you're going to get there whether, whether, we, whether, whether you try or not. I mean, there's only so many great cities on the face of the earth, right? Uh, and so now 
Notice she's got to be a city. She's got to be a great city. And now she's also got to be a city that is set on seven hills. Now they say that Rio de Janeiro, what's that, Boo? Mountains, hills, mountains, hills. Uh, yeah, okay. So, so uh, yeah, that's true. Sin on seven mountains or hills, and we can look up the definition. But <laughs> nevertheless, wasn't ready to go there. She be trying to get ahead of me. <laughs> So, so seven mountains, seven mountains. All right, so so so, so it's got to be a geographical location. It has to sit on seven mountains. Now, in our society, we have the definition of a mountain, uh, and, and, and our society def defines a mountain as a certain uh, elevation. But it has not always been defined that way. And in fact, if you study, if you just look at Webster's 1828 dictionary, which is a dictionary from about 200 years ago, there was no defined elevation required to define a mountain. Now, I'm saying all that to say this because we cannot take a Bible that was translated 400 years ago and, and, and force our definitions upon it. We have to ask ourselves, what was the definition of a word 400 years ago when it was translated? Everybody with me? That's what my, that's what my wife was saying. So, nevertheless, this is, she's, a, she's a city, she's a great city that's set on seven hills. I looked at the definition in Webster's 1828 night of a mountain and it actually said that a mountain though it is typically used and that was 200 years ago to describe an elevate a raised elevation that is above sea level and is typically used as the more big elevations in the Webster's 1828 dictionary said a mountain 200 years ago also was used to describe a hill to describe a hill so if you rewind, rewind 200 years prior to that when the Bible, when the King James Bible was translated. Uh, the, so, so I guess what I'm saying is we cannot take modern de definitions and apply it to a Bible that was translated 400 years ago. Everybody with me on that? All right. Uh, that's why sometimes when you go in the Bible and you see the word ASS in our culture, we pretty much define that as a curse word, don't we? Right. Uh, and, and, and me, if I were speaking, I would not describe a donkey as... Uh, the ASS, but that's what the Bible does, doesn't right. it? Yeah. Why? Because words change over time, and, and, and yeah. that's just the way it right. is. So, so, so I, I would call the donkey. The Bible did not. Uh, the point is, words change over time. So, the woman is a physical city. She is a great city, and she sits on seven mountains, or uh, I would say to you, seven hills. Seven hills. Now, so Rio de Janeiro sits on seven geographically raised the spots. But guess what? Rio de Janeiro is not the woman, in my opinion. Right. When, and I'll talk to you about why she's not in a little bit from now. But there is a city that is that is that is a great city. Yeah. That is a magnificent city yeah. uh, that, that world leaders flock to, that people flock to, yeah. that is its own geographical entity, that has its own currency, if, if, I'm, if I'm getting that correct, and I surely believe I am. Yeah. It is a great city that exercises great authority in the earth, and it has for the last 2,000 years been known as the city that sits on seven hills, yeah. uh, and it is the city of Rome. Yes, it is sir. the city of Rome. Yeah. Now, so I would just read this to you. Uh, this note from, from Dave Hunt writing on this subject says, There's only one city that, that has for more than 2,000 years been known as the city on seven hills. That city is Rome. Now, the Catholic Encycl Encyclopedia states, It is within the city of Rome. Now, this is a quote from the Catholic Encyclopedia. It is the city of Rome called the city of seven hills that the entire area of Vatican State proper is now confined. So what is the Catholic Encyclopedia telling us? It is telling us that Rome is called the city that sits on seven hills, or as the scripture says, seven mountains. So now, what are we looking for? We're looking for a city. We're looking for a great city, and we're looking for a city that has to be seated on seven mountains or seven hills. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sits. So if we're looking for a geographical location, a city, it's got to fit all these criteria, doesn't it? Right. It really does. So let's continue to read. Uh, let's take a look at Revelation 17 and 5. Revelation 17 and 5. So as far as I can tell, like we're really narrowing down the landscape of who this lady could be. Right. Are we? Yeah. I mean, we know she's not a physical woman. Nope. 
So she, right? She, she's not. Uh, she's not a, a, like a human being. She's a city. She's a great city. She sits on seven mountains. So we're really narrowing it down. Now, but Rio de Janeiro is still in, in the running. Right. Because it's a city. It's a great city. Yeah. And it is built on seven mountains. United States out of America, that's out of the running. Right. It's not because it is because that's the country. Uh, New York City not built on seven hills or seven mountains. That's out of the running. Uh, Jerusalem not built on seven hills. That's out of the running. Rome is in the running, and as far as I can tell, about the only place we got is Rio de Janeiro. Right. All right. Everybody with me? Yeah. All right. So let's continue to read uh, in, in Revelation 17 and number. Five. Yes, thank you. Uh, Revelation 17 and 5, we're going to continue to find clues. Remember, the angel told John that he would identify the lady. Now, if, if we are in court, uh, there are going to be so many clues as to her identity given that a jury would convict beyond a reasonable doubt. Right. Like it's just so many clues, and we're going to unpack them here in a minute. But there's so many clues that a jury would have no choice to convict because uh, to, to 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 say that that the evidence is overwhelming uh, as to who the lady is. Revelation 17 and 5. Let's take a look at that. The Bible says, "And upon her forehead, that's referring to the woman. Upon her forehead was the name written. Was, was a name written? Mystery, Babylon the Great." the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Yeah. Now that's a mouthful. Yes, but whoever this lady is, she is uh, described with some pretty graphic terms here. And the Bible calls her mystery. The Bible calls her Babylon. The Bible calls her the great, the mother of harlots and, and abominations of the earth. She's responsible for, 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 for creating uh, harlots. Right. Yep. That's what it says, the mother of harlots. Yep. Uh, she's responsible for creating abominations and sins in the earth. Yep. Right. She's responsible for these things. But I also want you to notice that her name, what her name is, her name is, in, I guess in two parts, number one, mystery, comma, and then it says, what, Babylon, Babylon. Yep. Right. So now, now we're kind of getting some clues here. Yeah. We really are, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, because now she's a city. She sits on seven hills. Uh, uh, what else was there? Uh, she's great. And now we discover that she, her name, the Bible actually gives us her name. Her name is Babylon. Yeah. Babylon. Babylon. That's interesting. If you will, go with me to First Peter. I didn't give my wife this verse, so let's see if she can get it before me. Amen. It's a race. Yeah. Amen. First Peter chapter 5. Amen. And we're going to look at verse number, I don't know yet. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. 1 Peter 5 and 13. Now, how many of y'all know that when we read 1 Peter, we're reading a book written by Peter? Hey, amen. Praise the Lord. Read a book written by Peter. And Peter is going to be writing this book, and he is going to be in a particular area. Like for tonight, for example, if I sat down tonight and wrote you a letter, I would be writing from Lot of Lead. Is that right? Right. Uh, that, but now in Water of Elite, we have a nickname for Water of Elite. I, I, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's a good one to say or not, but there's, there's a nickname for Water of Elite. Let me think of somewhere else. Uh, the, the, for the, the city of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, that's called the city of brotherly love, isn't it? Right. Right. So if I was in, in Philadelphia and I was writing, I could say I'm writing from Philadelphia, or I could say I'm writing from the city of brotherly love. Both would be synonyms to describe the same exact place. Right. So Peter is in a geographic location in first Peter chapter 5 verse 13 most scholars agree that Peter is writing from a place called Rome that's where he's at uh, now let's take a look in first Peter chapter 5 verse 13 and the Bible said now this is Peter's salutation to the to to the his readers he says the church that is at Babylon. Now, just about everybody, and I guess it could be debated, but, but I mean, just I would just say anybody who's ever studied uh, biblical New Testament history says Peter would have been in Rome while he was writing this book, and yet he says that he he, he greets his his readers by by greeting them as a representative of the church where he's at, and he says the church at, that is at Babylon elected together with you, saluteth you, and so. Doth Marcus, my 
the sun. So well, what am I saying? I'm saying that Babylon is indeed a nickname for Rome. Just like the city of brotherly love would be a nickname for Philadelphia. Uh, just like uh, 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 j Dog would be a, represent, a nickname for me. Some people call me j Dog. Amen. It's okay. Amen. I don't, I don't think it's that. I think it's a bad thing. j Dog. You call me j you call me brother J-Dog if you want to. <laughs> All right. I don't know. It doesn't really matter to me, but but, but you know, I never have been one that's real hung up on the titles and all that. And, and, you know, I just you know, you can call me Jason if you want to. It, it, uh, and I, I don't I don't announce it when I walk into a building. Hey, I'm pastor so and so. I just I just think it's odd and arrogant and prideful. And yeah. it's like, well, who, what do you want a cookie? That's my, that's how I think about it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, but nevertheless, that's my opinion. Uh, I, I, <laughs> Anyway, I'm not, I'm not going to go there, but I, I kind of want to go there. Uh, I met a guy the other day, and for the, within two minutes, he introduced himself as a pastor twice. And I thought to myself, well, do you want a cookie? Like, what is, like, you, you can just introduce yourself as your name. I'd be fine with that. I'd rather know you the man, not you what you do. Right. Right? So anyway, uh, so the church uh, that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluted you. So let me read to you this. Uh, Catholic, I would just read to you this on purpose because uh, from the Catholic perspective, uh, the Catholic uh, scholar by the name of Carl Keating admits that Rome has long been known as Babylon. It's a nickname for Rome. Uh, Keating claims that Peter's statements, the church at Babylon, uh, proves that Peter was writing from Rome. Keating goes on to explain, quote, Babylon is a code word for Rome. It is said in Peter's first epistle, uh, it is said that Peter's first epistle was composed at Rome itself and that he himself indicated this referring to the city figuratively as Babylon. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to tell you from, from, from Protestant scholar, from biblical scholar to Catholic scholar, just about everybody agrees that Babylon is a code name or is a nickname for Rome. Uh, so now we are getting some further evidence. Right. Like if Babylon was a nickname for the USA, and I say, okay, well maybe we need to go a different direction. But if Babylon was a nickname for New York City, I say, okay, well maybe we need to go a different direction. Right. But when, when, when then there's a great city, that's, right. that's built on seven mountains. It's been known as the city of seven hills for 2,000 years. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a great city. And now the Bible, Revelation 17 and uh, 3, defines part of her name as Babylon. And we know that Babylon is a nickname for Rome. The, the, the clues are pointing all one direction, aren't that's they? Right. Amen. Aren't they? Right. All right, so, so let's continue on. Oh boy, we got so much, so much to cover. Uh, yeah. Let's see what we can do. All right. right. Uh, is everybody okay tonight? Yes, sir. Yeah. Now, now, before you tell me that I'm anti any particular religion or I'm anti uh, Catholic or I'm anti this and anti that, I'm not. Right. I'm not anti-Catholic people. I, I, there are a lot of good, wonderful Catholic people out there, but there are some false religions out there. Uh, and if the Bible gives us all these clues and points us in this direction, I, I, I cannot escape its truth. Right. Okay. I cannot, and I will not. And I think we have an obligation right. to teach the truth of what this text teaches. Right. Now, I don't think that that means that all Catholic people are going to hell. I don't think that that means you should hate on Catholic people. Uh, that Catholic, there are a lot of good, wonderful, wholesome Catholic people out there. But I would just say, as a whole, the Catholic system is corrupted. Uh, and, 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 and just so you know, uh, there are some people out there that would vehemently disagree with me. And that's right. fine. And if you disagree with me, that's fine. But I just want you to take the evidence that's presented before you and see what you, see what you yeah. end up thinking. All right? Yeah. So, uh, so let's look at Revelation 17 and 5. five. Yep. Revelation 17 and 5. Uh, the Bible says, And upon her forehead was a name written. Uh, part of her name is Mystery. Mystery. Uh, also part of her name is Babylon. Part of her name is the... the the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So it says mystery. When it says Babylon, we know that Babylon is a nickname for Rome, but also part of her name is mystery. 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 That's, that's interesting. Uh, I looked up today 
Uh, Sean, I think I'm ready for that photo uh, of the of the uh, of the of the communion service. I looked up today uh, online because I wanted to see. I looked up today a, what a what a what a, uh, a communion service in the Catholic Church looked like. And by the way, I want to say this to you about communion. When we take communion to this church, we are not telling you, and certainly I am not, uh, and I would run from anybody who ever told me this. I am not telling you that 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 bread and that cup. And that juice turns into the literal body of Jesus Christ. That is nonsensical. Right? Like, I don't have the power to bless some man and turn into the body of Jesus. Right, right. Uh, but in Catholicism, that is exactly what they teach. They teach that when the priest blesses the wafer and he blesses the, 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 the wine, because they take literal alcohol and wine in their services, uh, they bless the wine, that, 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 that those elements literally turn in at that moment of blessing. Like this guy on the earth who's as fallible as everybody he has the power to bless bread and turn it to Jesus. No, like this doesn't sound right to me, folks. No, the, 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 what do we do when we take communion? Is a representation of the of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not, however, Jesus Christ in bread. Right. It is not. Right. right? Uh, but in Catholicism, that's what they teach. It's called the doctrine of transubstantiation. That when the Catholic priest blesses the wafer or the, or the bread and the, and the wine, that it literally at that moment turns in to the body and the blood of Jesus. And that is why Catholic folks are so interested in taking communion. Why? Because in Catholicism, that is the way that you get Jesus inside of you. You get him in you. You receive. They literally call it receiving Christ uh, through the communion. Uh, and in fact, Mel Gibson, when he was, who is a Catholic man, uh, when he was making his movies, uh, he said he would have the Catholic priest come out to the set of the movie daily, or at least weekly, and the Catholic priest would give him communion and bless the bread and bless the wafer and bless the wine so that Mel could have Jesus in him while making the movie. You don't get Jesus into you by eating bread. You don't get Jesus into you, certainly not by drinking wine. You get Jesus into you by believing the gospel. Yes, Amen. Yes, That's right. This is biblical Christianity yes. versus Catholic Christianity. And I'm telling you, whether you like it or not, there is a difference. Yes, there, there is, is a on. difference. Uh, so I looked up today uh, online. I wanted to watch uh, one of the, uh, the, the communion services in Catholicism. Uh, and I want you to notice that the name of the communion service uh, under, under the official liturgy is something called Mysterium Fide. D, how do you say that? Phi Di, Phi D, Phi D, I don't know how you say it. Phi Di, I don't know how you say it. Uh, I, don't, I don't speak Latin or whatever that is. <laughs> right. But the point is, they call the communion service, and actually, as soon as the priest gets done blessing the wafer and blessing the wine, he is going to say the words Mysterium Phi Di, if that's how you say that, which literally means the mystery of faith. The mystery of faith. Why do they say that? In fact, they actually said that sometimes they will begin to sing a song right after the blessing of the wafer, or right after the priest does his thing with the wafer and the wine and all that. Uh, he, they will sing a song that includes the words mysterium of fight, whatever that word is. Uh, and, and, and it simply means the, mis the mystery of faith. And what is the point? The point is you have to have, there's the, well, how, how, Mr. Priest, do you have the authority to bless a piece of bread that was just a piece of bread before you touched it uh, and now you have the authority to bless it and turn it into the physical body of Jesus how do you have the authority and the power to do that and by the way after you get done blessing it it looks the same exact way it did before you blessed it like, like if it was moldy it's moldy now if it had dirt on it it still has dirt on it I don't think Jesus has dirt on him do you amen you ever notice the, how superstitious they are about not dropping the wafer? Why? Because if you do it, you're literally, in their mind, under the, this is official Catholic teaching, in their mind, you're guilty of dropping the body of Jesus. Right. This is crazy talk. Yes, sir. But this is believed by 1.6 billion people across the face of the earth. Right. And so what does the, the Catholic Church call this, this ceremony? They call it Mysterium Five, whatever it is. Why? Because it's a mystery how that, that man, it's a mystery of faith. Well, please, please explain it to me. Where do you get this kind of authority? And how do you have the authority to forgive sins? I thought only God could do that. Amen. 
Like a Mr. Priest, how do you have the authority for you and I to get in a, in a, in a little porta potty and me confess all my sins to you? It's about the size of a porta potty. And me confess all my sins to you, and you have the authority to forgive my sins. Where do you get that kind of authority? It's just a mystery. A lot of Catholicism is shrouded in mystery. mystery. Let me read to you from this. Everybody with me or no? Amen. Amen. Am I saying that I'm anti-Catholic people? No, I'm saying that this is wrong doctrine. Yes, That's sir. what I'm saying. Amen. It says, every sacrament from baptism, uh, this is Dave Hunt writing, he says, every sacrament from baptism to extreme unction manifests the mysterious power which the faithful must believe the priests yield, but for which there is no visible evidence. Right? right? That bread doesn't look any different. That wine still got alcohol in it. I don't know how alcohol can be Jesus. That don't sound right. Jesus don't get you drunk, but that wine still has alcohol in it. It's still fermented. And yet, uh, they say they want you to believe it's a mystery. Uh, they want you to believe it's a mystery that he has the power to do that. I'm telling you, nobody has the power to do that. You don't receive Jesus by taking communion. You receive Jesus by believing on him and receiving Receiving him by faith as your personal Lord and Savior. And that is the only way to receive Jesus. And so if I if I was a practicing Catholic uh, and I wanted to make sure that I got to go to heaven when I passed away, then I would want to go take communion after communion after communion because it's the great the more I take it, the more I receive Christ. That's that that, that is what is believed in Catholicism. Right. Everybody with me? Yeah. So, uh, much of Catholicism is shrouded in mystery. What is the name of the woman? The name of the woman is Mystery. Okay. And the name of the woman is Babylon. Where is Babylon? What is Babylon? Babylon's a nickname for Rome. Rome is the headquarters of Roman Catholicism, and in particular Vatican City. And so Vatican City, Roman Catholicism, is all shrouded in mystery. Everybody with me or not really? Amen. Yeah. So let's continue to look who is this lady? Who is this lady? Now, by the way, if I was to tell you tonight, here's the way that all you folks out there need to be saved. You can't get saved by just simply believing on Jesus, like the Bible says. you got to come into church next Sunday, and I'm going to baptize you in the name of Jason. And somehow God has transferred divine power into me. And that is the true method of salvation. You all would run. I hope. You better run. And not only better you, not only you, you, you better run, uh, but, but I, I, I would imagine uh, everybody would run. But somehow, because when with the same thing, when the same thing happens in Catholicism, uh, people don't like to talk about it, and they act like you're some sort of crazy man for mentioning it. But I'm saying to you, listen: nobody has the authority to save you except Jesus. Amen. 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 Nobody has the authority to wash your sins away except God. Right. Amen. So let's continue to read verse number six. Uh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. I think maybe verse number six. Let's take a look here. Uh, I want to go to verse number two, actually. I guess. I don't know where I really want to go yet. We're going to go to verse number two. I have a whole lot of clicking down there. <laughs> yeah. uh, verse number two says, yeah, let's look, let's look at verse number two. Revelation 17 and two. We're picking out clues as to who this woman is. Right. Hey, if I told you Sunday that I could save you because God has granted some divine authority into me to do so, uh, would you believe that anybody who followed that system was truly saved? Verse number two, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. So who is this woman? She is somebody whom the kings of the earth, here's the next clue, this woman is a city. This woman is a great city. This woman has a name that's shrouded in mystery. And even today in 2021 on YouTube, you go look up the uh, Catholic Communion Service and right away it's named Mysterium Fidei or whatever that is. She's shrouded in mystery. Her name is Babylon. She sits on seven hills or seven mountains. And not only that, she is guilty of, watch this, committing fornication uh, with the kings of the earth. Verse number two, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Now I'm not sure if we know exactly what fornication is what it means but it simply means this it means sexual impurity to be involved and probably in, in probably even, even more defined it means to engage in the act of um, 
Uh, it, it, never, never, never less. I, 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 you guys can get the drift, right? Go ahead. All right. And so it means to be immoral, sexually immoral. Uh, and so the Bible says here that she's a city that has been sexually immoral. Now that is impossible for a city to commit physical fornication. Right. Like water believe cannot do that. It's a city. It can't do that. It must then be, the Bible also, the Bible talks about physical fornication, and the Bible also talks about spiritual fornication. Yeah. Uh, and it must be then that this lady is a city who can, she, is, she cannot be guilty of physical fornication because cities can't do that. So she must be guilty of spiritual fornication. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say then the woman is a city. Yeah. She's shrouded in mystery. Yeah. She sits on seven mountains or seven hills. Uh, and she must then be a spiritual city. Yeah. She must claim some sort of spiritual uh, connection to God if she's going to be able to commit spiritual fornication. Water Lee can't commit fornication, as far as I can tell, physically or spiritually. She's not a spiritual city. No. She's just a city. Right. So what, whatever, do you, know, you know the Bible said in the Old Testament that Jerusalem, which was a spiritual city, committed fornication and adultery and cheated on God, spiritually speaking, and served idols and served other false gods and stuff. Yeah. So she, whoever this woman is, she's got to be a physical. She's got to be a physical city committing spiritual adultery. She right. must then claim some sort of connection w with God. Right. So that, that kind of narrows this thing down even more. I hope you guys are getting the picture. Because now I'm kind of eliminating like a whole bunch of cities because they don't claim any connection with God. Right. Like I think they call New York City the, 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 the what do they call it? What's that? City that never sleeps. The city that never sleeps. All right, there's another one I'm looking for. Amen. Sin City. What are they? That's Las Vegas. That's Las, the Las Vegas, right? So Las Vegas uh, certainly doesn't claim to be a spiritual city. It doesn't have to claim any connection with God. It claims to be the, the city. What? What's it called again? Sin City. Thank you. For no reason that slipped on my mind. So what I'm saying is, uh, it's eliminating a whole lot of cities. It's got to be a city that claims a spiritual connection right. with God. Uh, amen. We're running out of time, but I want to give you another quote uh, from Mr. Dave Hunt. He says this, There is no way that a city could engage in literal, fleshly fornication. Cities aren't capable of such things. Thus, we can only conclude that John, like the prophet, Prophets in the Old Testament is using the term in its spiritual sense, spiritual fornication. The city, therefore, must claim a spiritual relationship with God. Otherwise, such an allegation would be meaningless. Right. So the city has to claim, at the very least, has to claim some spiritual uh, relationship with God. And guess what? Rome does that all day, every all day. day. And in God. fact, up until Rome, guys, particularly in, in, in America, got real politically correct. Up until because got real politically correct, it claimed pretty much to be the one true religion and all other religions were false. I mean, right. that's what it claimed. Yeah. Uh, you go back and read the Catholic Catechism, go back yeah. and read uh, the Vatican II Council, it yeah. claimed to be God's true church, the one holy mother church. It yeah. was, it claims to be, uh, to have a perfect connection with God and to be providing a relationship with God to for men and for women. But I would tell you that it is not. Amen. So it's got to be a spiritual city. So hopefully we're getting the, 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 the picture that she is a uh, city that is a spiritual city. So she is committing spiritual fornication against God. Now, verse number two, it says also, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. How many kings of the earth have, have been to Waterbury, Michigan? Like probably like none, <laughs> right? Uh, how many kings of the earth have been to Chicago? Well, maybe a few. Yeah. New York City, certainly so. That's where the UN is, right? So probably a lot of kings and representation from kings. Certainly a lot of kings. Lots, a lot of kings have been in Washington D.C. No right. doubt, right? right. Uh, so Washington D.C. Could this be a city? Could this be the woman? Well, no, because she wasn't built on seven hills. Oh. She doesn't claim any spiritual connection. She's not even shrouded, well, yeah, sort of in, in mystery, but so her name is certainly isn't Babylon. I mean, she doesn't have the nickname Rome. Uh, so, this, now, so man, this is kind of getting more narrow. 
That's right. So who is the lady? She's a spiritual city. And she is a uh, she is guilty of what? Committing fornication with the kings of the earth. Verse number two says, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Uh, so let's take a look at um, Mr. Trump. Let's do that. Y'all gonna love me. You know, okay. Y'all know I'm a Trump guy. Yes, but I'll show you Mr. Trump anyway, and we'll see who Mr. Trump is standing next to. Oh yeah. Uh oh, there he is. Oh, yeah. Show me Mr. Obama. There he is. Oh, yeah. oh, so now we're kind of getting the idea that maybe the kings of the earth are real connected to Rome. It seems like every king of the earth, every ruler, every governmental leader finds a way. They don't, they don't find a way to come to the Southern Baptist Convention. Right. They find a way to seek that guy out. Right. They find a way to get in touch with him. Why do they do that? Because he, not, I'm not necessarily saying he is, but I'm saying that system is in league with the kings of of the earth. Yeah. And that's why they seek him out, and that's why he seeks them out. Yeah. Uh, amen. Show me Vladimir Putin, who is the uh, Prime Minister currently, I believe, of Russia. Okay. Uh, amen. Uh, there he is. And man, out of all the he didn't, he didn't come to my church and say, hey, I'm the Prime Minister of Russia. I just want to meet the, the preacher at the Full Gospel Christian Tabernacle. He don't care about me. You know why? He don't even know I exist. You know why? Because I can, I can offer him nothing. But this guy runs a system that has 1.6 Six billion members, yes, and he's got a lot of control over the population of the earth. So, what do world leaders do? They seek him out. Who else do we have? Just as a just as a quick reference. Uh, I don't remember who else we put up. Oh, there's Mr. Biden. Oh, oh, there, he oh there he is. Oh, and by the way, yeah. Mr. Biden claims to be a good Catholic, but somehow good Catholics, the last time I looked, didn't didn't believe in just the unadulterated murder of children and the unborn. Right. Amen. 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 I don't know if we have anybody else, do we? We're oh, there's Mr. Oh. Pence. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, there's Mr. B I'm throwing everybody under the bus. Oh, what am I trying to say? I'm not trying to say Pence is bad or Biden is bad or any of them are bad. What I am trying to say is it should be clear by now that the world leaders do not have a connection to the Southern Baptist Convention. No. They don't have a, con a connection to the Church of God in Cleveland, Tennessee. No. They got a clear connection to Catholicism. They have a connection, whether they are Catholic or not, yeah. they have an obligation to meet with that man right there. Yes, no that doesn't just mean this man, the Pope Benedict, I guess they call him. It doesn't just mean him. Uh, by the way, he just came out the other day and said same-sex unions were okay. That's like vehemently anti-Catholic. Like that, that's a, the, the, in the Catholic Church, if you used to get a divorce, they chop your head off. Yes, sir. Right? I and mean, then now they say you can marry a dude. Um, so, so, oh boy, we're running out of time. Aren't we? So this lady is, is, a, uh, is somebody who has influence with world leaders. Uh, the Bible said the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Here's an article from July 2017. It says, Pope Francis told world leaders at the G20 summit, when's the last time you heard a religious leader telling world leaders anything? Right. They don't let Pentecostal folk tell world leaders things. They don't even listen to us. They don't let Baptist folk tell world leaders. They don't even listen to them. But they do listen to that man. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. So uh, let's, let's, let's continue on. Verse number four. We're just, I'm just going to keep teaching. And if you've got to go, you can go. Okay? Go Verse number four. Uh, and the woman was arrayed in purple. So now we see the color of the clothing of the woman. She was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. Do you know even back in the ancient Roman Empire, the two colors that the emperors wore was scarlet uh, and purple? Right. So scarlet and purple, it's connected with the old Roman Empire. It is. And in fact, you remember that when they crucified Jesus, Rome was in control at the time. Y'all remember that, right? Yeah. Uh, and the Roman soldiers were standing around the foot of the cross, and they stripped Jesus of his clothes. And you know what they did? They said, Jesus, if you're a king, you should be wearing the color of okay. purple. Purple. Yeah, they put a purple robe on them. According to John, I believe it is about 19, Matthew 27, verse 28, 20, 
Matthew 27, verse 28 and 29. So the point was, they said, Jesus, if you're really a king, here's what we're used to seeing. We're used to seeing all the kings wear purple. So this land, what kings? The Roman kid, the Roman uh, emperors, they wore purple. Uh, so that said, uh, this lady wears purple. Uh, now that she wears scarlet. Now it is said, according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, and I'm just, I'm just telling you the facts. You guys uh, can, can make up your own minds, okay? Amen. Amen. I'm not telling you what to believe. I'm just telling you what the facts are. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, it says, quote, The clothes fitting uh, ankle length robe worn by Catholic clergy as their garb. The, uh, so the Catholic Encyclopedia is describing the colors that Catholic clergy are supposed to wear. And it says this, The color of bishops and other prelates, whatever that means, is purple and the color of cardinals is scarlet Rashonda, here we go right. amen and there we are and if you look at any picture google any picture catholic bishops and catholic cardinals the higher you get up in the catholic hierarchy the different clothes you have to wear and what are these gentlemen arrayed in they're arrayed in purple and scarlet now i mean i don't know about y'all but, but 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 this is getting so narrow that I can no longer even entertain the idea that it's, that the city is Chicago. No, I can't even entertain that it's New York City. It's kind of looking like it's kind of like Rome to me. Rome, Rome to me. All right, so let's continue uh, to, to to read uh, in the, in the text of Scripture because I gotta I gotta hurry and close. Rashad, the next picture we're gonna go to is back to the picture of the priest giving the communion. Now look at verse number four with me, talking about the woman's clothing. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and she was also verse number four decked with gold. Now I don't know if that maybe we we got there. You go decked with gold, and watch what the woman had. She had. Uh, gold and precious stones and pearls having a what? Golden cup. Golden cup. Do you know in Catholicism, they will not let you receive Jesus by you know, the communion unless it's in a golden cup. Golden cup. Now, what is it? where is that in the Bible? Right. It's not. No, sir. There's so much mystery involved here, so much tradition involved here, just so much just just absolute the tradition of men involved here that you can't receive. First of all, you're not receiving Jesus when you should receive communion. But second of all, they say you can't receive Jesus unless it comes out of a golden cup. Uh, unless it comes out of a golden cup. Everybody with me? Okay. All right. So he says uh, this is also the Catholic Encyclopedia says uh, it is. Uh, it is the most important of the sacred vessels. We don't have any sacred vessels here. No, Except you. You're a sacred vessel yeah, as far as I'm concerned. Right. That cup is a sacred vessel. No. This poop is a sacred vessel. And contrary to what some folk believe, pews and chairs are not sacred vessels either. <laughs> Except God's people, Amen, Amen. Amen. So uh, the, the, they say the, the cup uh, is the most sacred of all vessels uh, in, in Catholicism. It may be of gold or silver, but if of silver, then the inside must be surfaced with gold. Now, I mean, where does this stuff come from? Not from the Bible, folks. That's why I tell you, uh, if, if you go into this system, you're going more into the, the mysteries and the traditions of men than you are into biblical Christianity. So the woman had a golden cup. Now, out of all the cities, that's a spiritual city that sits on seven hills, that's committed to fornication with the kings of the earth, that has the name mystery, that has the name Babylon, and that serves communion in a golden cup like that, it's just getting so narrow, I can't cannot go anywhere else. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Now also I want you to look at verse number five, and then I'm going to let you go home soon probably, or maybe, or maybe not. <laughs> but we got a lot of ground to cover, so we might as well cover it all tonight. Bye, Amen. Verse number five says, And upon her forehead, this is talking about the woman, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great. Watch what it says, the mother of hearts. Amen. Now I cannot believe, I do believe, but it's hard to believe that but not, but I guess it's just amazing, I guess is the word I'm looking for. It's amazing that John 2,000 years ago could look into the future and see all of this and accurately describe it so vividly that he actually says this woman is the mother of Harlots, the mother of harlots. What do I mean by that? I mean in, the, in, the, in, the, in a spiritual sense, the lady has offspring. Right. 
But in a physical sense, I want you to know this, in a physical sense, the woman has also produced offspring. What do I mean by that? I mean that the Catholic Church has a doctrine for its ministers that is so anti-biblical right. uh, that it's, un it's unimaginable, it's unthinkable, and yet they require it of every person, every male Catholic priest, and that is the doctrine of celibacy. That's right. The doctrine of celibacy. celibacy. Now the Bible says that if, uh, if you find a wife, you find a good thing. The Bible says that it's not good for the man to be alone. Uh, the scripture even said of a bishop, 1 Timothy 3, uh, that he is to be the husband of one wife, so it's okay for the bishop to get married, but in Catholicism it is not. Bible, it's okay. Catholicism, it's not. What happens to a man who has d desires uh, and now his desires are, are bound by some sort of false religious system? He cannot get married. What does he do? Man, we all know what he does. Come on, somebody tell me what's been going on in the news for the last 30, 40 years. Do you know, okay, it's just true. Let, let me say this to you. Here's an article that came out of Coloma, Michigan, January 27, 2020. A Coloma priest has been sentenced to 60 days in jail. It should have been a lot longer. After pleading guilty of false imprisonment, he admitted to buying a, uh, excuse me, binding a teenage boy in plastic wrap. And then you... you Yes. You guys get the story. That's yes. disgusting. That's filthy. But by the way, it's not just in Catholicism. This about every. This every. This about every denomination has those filthy perverts. Yes. Amen. And sixty days is not enough, as far as I'm concerned, for anybody that would hurt a child. Right. Amen. But beyond even the church, everybody with me or not really? Right. All right. So, so be, but be even beyond that, uh, there was a article, if I can find it, where, oh man, I lost it now. Praise the Lord. But nevertheless, let me see right here one more. Yeah. No, it's not there anymore. Anyway, there was an article where uh, uh, the, 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 the women, it was, a, it, was a, it was an article within the last couple of years, the women began to come, women nuns began to come forward in the Catholic Church, particularly when all the women in America started coming forward and saying that they had been taken advantage of by men in powerful positions. The women in the Catholic Church, the among nuns in the Catholic Church, they started to get a little uh, a little backbone too because of other people stepping forward. You know, by the way, the, the, I think Mr. Como has about seven allegations and <laughs> gets right. to this point. But nevertheless, uh, it's just a true story. Yeah. You put a man in powerful places and men are... Yeah. Sometimes bad, and they take right. advantage of people underneath them. And for years, priests, according to the nuns, have been taking advantage of uh, these nuns that have also taken the vow to celibacy. I mean, and it's a documented history. Go look at a book called The Priest, The Woman, and the Confessional. You take a man who is bound to celibacy, and you put him in a tiny booth with a female, and the female comes in there and confesses her deepest, darkest secrets. And what do you think that does to the man? Right. Right. Come on, we know that. We should have understanding of what I'm saying. And then guess what? The lady leaves the booth. Either that or she's taken advantage of by the man. There's been plenty of that. Not just in Catholicism, but in Pentecostalism and Baptist right. and everything else. Okay. But there it is. Uh, they take advantage of them. Uh, and that false doctrine, it is a false doctrine that a man shouldn't get married. Right. Amen. Unless God would just specifically grace you for that gift. But other than that, you ought to find yourself a wife. Hallelujah. Yeah, sir. Amen. Amen. Uh, that's right. Uh, and so all these, these, these priests, I mean, these nuns have come forward for a long time. And guess what happens? The, 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 the priest gets away scot-free because, and in fact, they have trained the nuns, according to the nuns themselves. I wish I had the article still. I can get it if I need to. Uh, they, they still, uh, they have trained the nuns to believe that it is the nuns' fall for sedition seeing such holy men. Right. Amen. And they blame the nun. And guess what happens? The priest goes on to continue to offer wafers and, and bless cups. And then the nun goes on to have a baby be excommunicated from her position and be lived in shame. And guess what Rome has been doing for centuries? It has literally been creating mm, the mothers. Uh, it's really, they've literally been creating harlots in uh, the, the earth. Uh, not in the sense that the women are bad, but in the sense that they're taken advantage of by the men. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I wish I had more time, but I'm running out of time. 
Uh, let me read this to you from Dave Hunt's notes. He notes uh, that not only has celibacy made sinners of the clergy who engage in fornication, but it has made harlots, this is a tough language, but it has made harlots out of those who secretly cohabit. Rome is indeed the mother of harlots. Her identification is unmistakable. No other city, no other church, no other institution in history of the world could rival that name. Catholic historian and former Jesuit uh, uh, Peter de Rosa says the popes had mistresses. Uh, this, is, this is Catholic historian. The pope had, had mistresses of 15 years of age who were guilty, and the popes were guilty of incest and sexual perversion of every sort. They had in children, uh, innumerable children who were, who, well, anyway, I'm not, I'm going to just stop there. And I'm going to give you one more clue. Everybody went there now, right? Yeah. Now, now, we're past a little bit of time tonight, but it, by the way, if you need to go, feel free. I, I won't be offended in the slightest. But since we're here, we want to just finish up, okay? Right. So he says, uh, let's continue to, to look at verse number six. Verse number six. Revelation chapter 17, verse number six. Man, I wish I had more time to hang on that, on some of these articles that I found today about the, the, the abuse of, uh, of women. And, now we, and we all know the abuse of children in Catholicism. Right. Right. right? Yes, Altar boys and, and these priests and yeah. uh, yeah. Revelation 17 and 6. Uh, and the Bible says, And I saw the woman. So the woman, whoever she is, the city, the city on seven hills, spiritual city, etc., etc. Uh, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So in clue number whatever it is, this lady is drunk, uh, but she's not drunk just in any way. She's drunk having killed the followers of Jesus. Yeah. Now, do you know, according to history, uh, back, in, back in the 1700s, because Catholic Church has been around for a long time. Yeah. In the 1700s, the Catholic Church engaged in something that were called the Inquisitions. They called them the Holy Inquisitions, but there was nothing holy about them whatsoever. That's right. right. Uh, and what they pretty much did was they said anybody who deviates from official Catholic teaching, for example, anybody who doesn't think Jesus is blessed and uh, by the priest and becomes the that that wafer becomes Jesus, anybody who doesn't think that is guilty of heresy. And they, uh, this is according to Wikipedia, uh, it says according about the Institute, the Inquisition. The Inquisitions in the historical ecclesiastical terminology was a group of institutions within the Catholic Church whose aim was to combat heresy. Uh, it used the methods of torture and violence in order to combat heresy and to punish the heretics. Uh, in, in the said that I'll just give you one of the inquisitions, and you can read about this in history. This is no, this, is, right, this is not this is not Jason only facts. I mean, history bears this stuff out. There was something called the Spanish Inquisition, and in that Inquisition, uh, the, that the Catholic Church engaged in, the uh, the historian uh, by the name of Canon Laurenti, uh, who was the secretary of the Inquisition in Madrid, that be Spain from 1790 to 1792. So he was an eyewitness and also his and historian. He said, and had access to the archives of the tribunals estimated, based on his research, that in Spain alone, the number of condemned exceeded three million. Wow. So the Catholic Church said, how many of y'all don't believe exactly what we teach? Now this is history. Right. This is not what they're doing, at least in America today, but this is history. How many of y'all don't believe what we teach? A number of three million, they tortured them, they, 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 they uh, executed them, and uh, by this, this historian, Canon Laurenti, said that of the three million, it was estimated by him that 300,000 were burnt alive. Oh, wow. What is the woman drunk with? She's drunk with the blood of the saints. She's drunk with people that picked up the Bible and said, wait a minute, we don't believe a priest has the power to forgive sins. Only Jesus does. Did you know that before the Bible was ever translated by King James translators, the Bible was first translated into English in about 1300 by a man by the name of John Wycliffe. But according to official translate, according to official Catholic teaching at the time, you could not own the Bible in English. It was against Catholic rules. Why? Because if you read it for yourself, you might come away with something different than what they said. So they banned it. William w uh, uh, Wycliffe, uh, he translated the Bible in about 1300s uh, into English, into that, into the form of that English in the day. When they found out about it and he had died, they dug up his bones and burnt his bones. This is history. 
You, you don't have to get this from Jason.com. Go to Wikipedia. It's there. A man by the name of William Tyndale translated the Bible. In fact, 80% of what's in the King James Bible came straight out of Tyndale. Before, before King James translators ever got involved, Tyndale translated at least the New Testament into English. And guess what the Catholic Church did to him? Catholic Church was in power at that time in England. Guess what they did to him? They put him in prison for 500 days. And on the 501st day, they pulled him out of prison and they burnt him alive at the stake. And William Tyndale's dying prayer prayer was, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. That's right. That's a dying prayer. That probably wouldn't be my dying prayer. <laughs> no, maybe I'd hope it would be, but probably not. Right. So what am I saying? I'm saying that the lady is indeed, if you think about it, Catholicism is indeed drunk with the blood of the martyrs Amen. of Jesus. Amen. Not only that, Christian Rome, Christian Rome a slaughtered Jews by the thousands. That's right. right. I, I, I'm just running out of time. But what I am saying is, uh, she's a city. Yes. She's built on seven hills. Yeah. Uh, she's shrouded in mystery. Yes. She's clothed in purple and scarlet and gold. Yeah. Uh, there is no true salvation found in right. her teachings, but people can find Christ. Amen. Amen. And get saved. Amen. You see in there. Oh, that's my last picture. Yeah. There's a gentleman. Oh man. Oh. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Who's that guy? That's Paul. Who's that guy? Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> Oh, bless the Lord. I just want to throw it out there for good measure. I forgot I gave that to you. Amen. Well, what am I saying? I'm trying to say this. Uh, I am not anti-Catholic. I'm not anti-Catholic people. There are a lot of wonderful Catholic people out there. But I am anti that system because there is no salvation. No, that's good. Uh, and therefore, I cannot go hold hands with the Pope like Mr. Copeland did. And I can't do that. I cannot do that. Uh, amen. I can't. That's good. Why? What must I do? I must preach the gospel. Amen. That's right. To, amen. to who? To everybody. Amen. amen. Even to the Pope. He needs the gospel too. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord.